Welcome to a new episode of Delphine Circle, where we uncover the mind, body, and spirit of success. Subscribe now for free to receive updates on the latest interviews. Then sit back, relax, and tune in. Yes. Uh, I used to be so horrible at this five or six years ago. I would probably go to sleep at around, uh, I would say, probably nine or 10 in the morning. And I would wake up at like five or six at night. Uh, the biggest oh, routine, We don't know anybody that does that. Yeah. Not good. Not healthy. It's not a good thing to do. Not a good way to live your life. Um, the most important thing I think I did was like getting my sleep schedule in order. So I'm waking up at the latest like 11 or 12 in the afternoon and then trying to go to sleep anywhere from midnight to like 2 to 3 a.m., mm-hmm. uh, which maybe even that sounds extreme to some people, but it's a yeah. big improvement over going to sleep when the sun comes out. Absolutely. Um, so I would say having a consistent sleep schedule is pretty important. Um, over the past like about four months ago, I started getting into working out and that only matters if you do it consistently. Um, the gym doesn't do much if you go once every two weeks or if you're kind of scattered. Um, and yeah. Now, so so yeah. what is it that made you decide to make these changes in your life? Um, the sleep thing uh, was kind of health and kind of business. Uh, nobody likes it if your stream is all over the place. They don't know when to schedule you into their time mm-hmm. if you're streaming at totally different hours every time of the day. Also, if you're in a relationship, it's probably nice to go to sleep and wake up with your partner instead of they're coming out of the bedroom and you're going in, you're like, right. oh, see you later. You know, not a good thing. Absolutely. Um, so the sleeping thing was big. Um, the gym thing, uh, I just, for somebody in my position, I don't think there's an excuse to be super out of shape uh, because I have the f- most flexible schedule in the world and I have as much free time as I want. So um, yeah, I made that change. Yeah. Good for you. It's positive. Yeah. I do. I, uh, I walk in the park most days. I get up and... Uh, on the best days, I leave my cell phone behind and I don't really talk. I just walk and appreciate nature and breathe the air and uh, try and live in the moment. Are you doing a brisk walk? Is this an exercise? No, no this is a no. this is emotional, spiritual, mental break. Usually lasts for about an hour, hour and a half, and I'll go sit by the fountain um, and just uh, you know think about things that are happening in my life. And it's really interesting because. I remember one time walking and I was uh, had this visualization of like just a cup of tea, right, that you might drink. And I was having good thoughts and the tea was clear. And then all of a sudden I thought about somebody that, you know, I had perceived had done some wrong. And then I, I see like this image in my head of milk being poured into the tea and all of a sudden it becomes cloudy. Mm. And in that moment I was like, wow, that's, you know, what happens when you let your mind wander mm. and you focus on these things and then you judge them as bad or wrong. So, I mean, sometimes the lessons are really simple. Other times there's nothing. Um, Sometimes you don't even know, you know, what the lesson is, but it's happening. Like you can feel yourself releasing energy. So I think getting out into the nature and connecting is is a good way for me. My day, so the only thing routine about my day is really the, the prayer time that I have in the shower every morning. That is probably the most consistent thing about my day. That's how I start my day. I start my day in prayer. I start my day... Uh, spending time uh, quieting my my soul, uh, asking for guidance, and, and really preparing my heart and my mind for the day ahead. Beyond that, my days are pretty much chaotic, mm-hmm. but I kind of like it that way. I like the fluidity of my days. Uh, be, even before I got into the political realm as an entrepreneur, I mean, your your days can be, you know, you can go in a hundred directions. It's not for everybody but I thrive in that environment of not really knowing what my day is going to hold. But being anchored uh, in my morning prayer, being anchored in my faith, allows me to face all of those uh, audibles, we call them, um, courageously, confidently, and, and, and intentionally. I'm big on positive mental focus. Um, and I feel like in 2020, during quarantine, I kind of fell off of that a lot. And I was like, oh, we have all day to do whatever we want. <laughs> and I didn't get into routine. Um, as much as I love freedom, I'm a number one freedom person. I have to be able to dictate my own schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that, I also love discipline. So and I believe in mental discipline. So I, getting back to the grind, having multiple uh, companies to help support, 
Um, I believe in a grind of staying true to having mental toughness. So to answer your question on routines, I wake up every day at 5.30 a.m. Um, I try and work out every morning. If I'm not working out, I'm doing something. But try and wake up every morning from there. And <clears throat> David Goggins, I'm a huge David Goggins fan. And it's all about the mental toughness side on telling your brain, this is what we're doing, period. Like there's no other option. And I feel like it translates perfectly into the business world because when I didn't want to get two hours of sleep and have to go pick up trash in Austin, my mind was already callous to believe that this is what has to get done. Mm -hmm. Stop complaining. Mm -hmm. And so for 2022, I said, there's zero complaints out of my mind. This is just opportunity for improvement. This is what needs to happen. And we're going to do this. So no complaints. You just got to move forward. So my routine, wake up every day at 530. Uh, traditionally go uh, to the gym in the morning. I usually work out twice a day. But first thing, and then I have a very, very high energy 90 pound beast that lives with me. And if I don't take him for a walk, he goes bonkers throughout the day. So I come home, I have a large Doberman. So I take him for a walk for about 45 minutes. And then I usually get into my day. So mm -hmm. through emails, uh, throughout trying to eat snacks left and right, and then go into different um, networking opportunities. I'm huge on networking, mm -hmm. um, big on if you're not there, then you're not meeting someone mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind. So it usually encompasses the day. I also have a strict regimen of reading every single day. Love it. So I have to continue to stimulate my mind. So it could be uh, late at night and coming home from the bars. And if I haven't read, I, my OCD kicks in and I have to make sure I, I follow through with my word. So that's kind of my routine throughout my day. Well, my wife says after I work out every day, which I do, I mean, we might take one day off a week. Um, you know, I mean, I typical day I get up, make a protein shake. Um, bring my wife a, a large uh, vanilla chai tea. Good a husband. Lot of, a lot of sweetener. Take the dog, my little wired hair dachshund, take, let him out. Um, have my protein shake. And we, you know, usually go to the gym. Uh, you know, have what, what type of workout do you like to do? I do, uh, well, you know, I have my knee replaced, which is the best thing I ever did because mm. I, I put it off for 20 years and Finally, after about 18 years, I mean, I had it done after 20, but I should have had it done. After Can I tell you how many times I've heard people say that? A lot of guys put it off, put it, oh, women too, but more, more, I've well, had a lot of guy have, friends have, that have had have it. Have you ever looked thing. at what they actually do? Yeah, it's pretty gross. Yeah, right? but except if you go to the right doctor, I went to a guy, Robert Gorab out here, who did a bunch of my former teammates' hips and everybody, I, all the PT guys, because I had had, I waited for my back and so on and so on. So, um, you know, so I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I won't run on the treadmill, mm -hmm. but I, I row, mm -hmm. I bike, uh, do rotator cuffs every other day, you nice. know, and, and my shoulder stuff. I do all kinds of stretching, do, you know, I mean, all kinds of Could work. you still model briefs? Um, well, uh, the, <laughs> the extra side, you know, the stretching room at, at, at Shape Up is very dark, so probably I <laughs> to try and sleep in late. <laughs> um I don't, yeah, not really. Uh, being an artist, I can kind of do anything, yeah. and go any direction. That it's I always want. kind of been the life of an artist, huh? It's like yeah. the fluidity of it is. Yeah, and you're and you're just open to everything. So if something comes up, uh, I do like to body surf as much as I can. Mm -hmm. I like to be in the ocean and sailing, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, routine. I the only routine I think I have is I get up and eat yogurt and. Uh, <laughs> and granola in the morning that after that. That sounds delicious. Anything, I'd like to do that open. too. <laughs> ah, I sleep. Um, that's that's something that most people in Hollywood can't say. <laughs> about seven years ago, um, I was gifted transcendental meditation, so I learned it, and uh, it was a big change in my life. Um, from that day to this, pretty much every day. I do that twice a day. So the first thing I do before I look at my phone, before I put my glasses on, before I, you know, I, uh, I, I meditate. Mm -hmm. And I, I set a timer and I, so I don't fall, well, so that when I fall back to sleep, I, I can get up. And then in my office every day, it's kind of a, a funny joke about my office. At about three o'clock, I shut the door and I take 30 minutes and I meditate in my office, just sitting up in a chair. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really changed my life. So of, of any daily routine, I would think that's the most important. Now, when you got started in that, um, especially with somebody that works at the 
level that you do, most people say, oh, I tried meditation and, you know, I can't quiet my mind. My, I have a very busy life. How are you able to get into that? If somebody says that, it's literally true. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that. But they didn't try long enough or hard. You know, it's like, it's not something you have to try. It's just something you have to do. Mm -hmm. To the extent you try, you probably are going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. you can't like say, uh, I got to think of nothing. I got to think of nothing. It, it doesn't work like that. But to the extent you just sit and be quiet every day, twice a day for a month, you're going to be more quiet. Mm -hmm. So eventually that's going to go away. And once that goes away, think of the ramifications of having a quiet mind. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it, it, it's changed my life significantly and it would for them. I actually started working with a coach about a year and a half ago, um, Dr. Aaron Bennis. He's the complete coach. And for me, it was more about spirituality and mindset. So I have kind of a process of things that I do every day. Ooh, I love this kind of stuff. <laughs> do tell. So I wake up in the morning before I get out of bed. I recite by heart something called my declaration. Mm -hmm. um, then I usually do, um, I get some kind of exercise in every day, but I usually will go outside and do morning sun for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Just being outside in the right. sun, get, you know, your melatonin, everything starts working properly. Yeah. Which is so good for well, your look health, at that gorgeous weight. color you have on your skin. So it's beautiful. <laughs> I know. I actually said to Dr. Aaron, I was like, do I wear sunblock? And he's like, no, no. don't wear sunblock. Just go out for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I get, I do a little bit of exercise every day, whether it's yoga, Pilates, um, circuit training, mm -hmm. playing tennis. Um, and then every night before I go to bed, I write out my declaration as well, mm -hmm. which if you so it's like. the same de declaration every day. It is. Okay. If you like, I could share it with you. Yeah. So could it you? might take a minute. Can I copy it? <laughs> no, you have to do your own. You have own. to do your own. You have to do your own. Okay. It's something that I worked on for, it took me about, I don't know, four or six months to work on. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes, please share it. Okay. Um, I'm evolving and growing into peace. I am that I do my best. I am smart. I am a powerhouse. I am very kind and loving. I am unique and one of a kind. I am beautiful. I am confident, happy, energetic, and light, and I love my body. I am skinny by nature. I am healthy. I am strong in my core. I am good at sports. I am able to give lots of love. I am filled with love for those I care about. I am love. I am in love with the strong man Richard is. I am always loving with Richard. I am everything that Richard needs me to be. I'm a very giving, generous, and loving person. I'm someone who people look up to. I am a good mom, a good wife, a good sister, and a good daughter. I am in tune with myself and others. I'm grounded. I'm stretching myself. I'm doing the best I can. I'm a positive person. I am loved the way I am. I'm content with who I am. I'm happy the way I am. I'm becoming wiser every day. I am that whatever life hands me, I handle with ease and grace. I am at peace. Oh my gosh. I love that. Thank you for I letting me share. I can see why <laughs> it took you four to six months to put that together because you probably kept adding to it, right? Yes. <laughs> and what is the goal of the declaration? The goal is to, what by repeating these these um, kind of mantras mm -hmm. on a daily basis. This is who I am. It's so mm -hmm. broken down. Like I'm working with my coach. It's not just saying it. It's literally that every cell in your body knows who this is who you are. Yeah. And it's how you show up. Yeah. So I do my best to show up. How long have you been doing that? Um, I have been writing it out every night for about 400 days now. Um, there are a couple of missed nights. Like I was in Las Vegas and we were out and I missed writing it that night. Um, <laughs> that happens, but, um, yeah, it's a practice. It's my meditation. Yeah. I love it. Have you noticed anything shift inside of you since you've been doing that? I think if you ask pretty much anybody who knows me, um, whether it's like my mom, my husband, my kids, friends, they'll say mm -hmm. that I am so much more settled and peaceful. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal. I mean, yeah. I begin with, I'm evolving and growing into peace, mm -hmm. and I end with I am at peace. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to be peaceful in a chaotic mm -hmm. world. Wow. I love it, honey. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really powerful. Thank you. Any other things you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. 
It's always evolving, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I do the same five things every morning. Mm. I make my bed, I journal, I meditate, I exercise, usually yoga, uh, and I have a matcha latte. Wow, very cool. Doesn't matter where I wake up in the world, those are the first five things that I do in the day. How long does that process take you? Depends. You know, I am really committed to the daily practice mm -hmm. and the ritual of it and less focused on the rigidity of how long the meditation is or what kind of yoga practice or how long a hike is. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's just about knowing that those rituals ground me mm -hmm. and... Um, it kind of expands to fill whatever time I have. But I, I definitely set the alarm and wake up in enough time to be able to do them before I need to leave for the day. I pray 50 times a day. 50 times? 50 times a day. I pray every night. Over and over, I say the Lord's Prayer. And I started doing that when I was taking radiation because I'm claustrophobic. And they had to, they made a body cast, put me in this tongue. And I just said the Lord's Prayer over and over and over again. And that's when I became religious and when I, my religion came back. Wow. Yeah. So had you lost it at some yes. point? Yes. Yeah, I had lost it. Uh, when I was nine, I lost it. When my grandfather died. Mm. But it came back. Yeah. Well, they, you, it's important to have it when you need it, right? Yes. <laughs> absolutely. I think you need to find the things in life that make you happy, and then I think you need to orient your life around pursuing and maximizing those things. Um, I think that when people think about like what makes them happy, the worst possible thing you can do, it's better to have a wrong answer than no answer, because if you have no answer, then society is going to fill that in for you. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a culture where everybody wants to sell you something or tell you what to do or get you to you know buy or join some group or whatever, uh, it's very easy to get kind of lost in a sort of rat race. Uh, I know if there's anybody listening in, in their 30s for millennials, there's a lot of people that made all the right steps. They did well in high school. They went to college. They got a good job. And now they're making, you know, 70, 80, 90,000, maybe six figures now. And they're super miserable because they're not doing anything they like or love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really sad. And that's actually really common in my age group where it's like, oh, you know, like, well, what do you like to do? or What do you enjoy? And it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, I work a lot. And, you know, sometimes I watch Netflix and, you know. I have all this money and nothing to do with it or no fun or no hobbies or whatever. So yeah. I think finding something that you really enjoy in life and then orienting your life around being able to do that is really important. Do you know your answer is the closest to how I think than anybody else I've interviewed? Oh, cool. I always say that the purpose of life is to find joy. Huh? And if you can find joy and orient your life around that path of finding joy, then you're always going to live a happy life. And usually you will end up finding yourself in very successful places because when you're joyful, you attract positive energy. Hopefully, yeah. So, yay, thank you. I love that answer. The purpose of life is to come here and uh, learn to love. And like I mentioned before, loving yourself is an extremely difficult thing to do. People can lo uh, love their kids unconditionally. I see them loving their pets unconditionally. Uh, rarely do you see somebody loving themselves unconditionally. So we've got to figure out how to love ourselves. That's a good good. It's a good start, start right? Yeah. It's a great start. What's a piece of advice that you've been given that you always remembered? The one that sticks with me is I was actually in our Sarsawak, Greenland, and I was talking to another pilot. This was my first time crossing the North Atlantic, and we were in the uh, cafeteria, and they were cooking whale meat, which smells terrible and <laughs> tastes terrible. Um, and it, he he sort of stopped for a second, and he said, you know, He said, no matter how hard it gets, just to not give up and to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't you know, sure what he was talking about. Like, why did he like suddenly introduce that? And um, at the time, I thought it was uh, in a crash situation, you know, because people give up when it mm -hmm. when it's imminent. And um, I think it applied to much more than that. And we had a, you know, a moment there. Um, where he was sharing something really important that I've used, you know, time and time again. And I remember you referencing in, a, in the book quite a few mm -hmm. times as well. So that is something that stuck with you for sure. I think we're here to live in the fullness and the authority that God's given us. I believe that we all have a purpose. I believe that 
that our time here on earth is, is to identify ways in which we could be more like him in every way, loving on each other, developing who we are. Um, but I believe that it, it's, it's really an opportunity for us to pour into what is to come. And he's given us an opportunity to say, I'm going to give you some time separate and away from me so that when you come back to me, the treasures that I have for you and what you'll have for eternity will be based on who you were during that time, that small blink of an eye amount of time that I've given you to interact with others. And I think that's ultimately what we're here to do. Very well put. I like that one. (laughs) You said talking about the purpose of life. I am big on energy transfer. Um, I don't know if it's from the movie Avatar, but I feel like everything, every atom, there's a purpose and energy attachment to it. Um, you also then talk about love. And I think love is another energy source. And I've had to learn through some tragic uh, times in my life that uh, love, there is a purpose for love and there is a purpose for life and why we're here on this planet. We can get into the whole religion thing, but I believe in the Big Bang and someone somewhere said, go, explosion happened, all energy started spiraling out of control. And here we are today in January of 2020, 22, talking to each other. Um, and so it's really just that whole energy transfer. And what I believe the purpose of life is to love. Um, and I feel that we are giving energy source from our planet to the universe and atmosphere. And there's a bigger meaning for that of what's happening as we're on this spinning rock. Um, I think Men in Black does a great job at explaining perception. Um, There's one scene at the end when he opens up a locker room and there's like a whole world inside of the locker room. And also I believe it's on one of her orbs. That's like a whole universe. Or they're playing marbles. Mm -hmm. And the guy's throwing marbles and it's an actual universe with like planets inside. And maybe we're just a big marble that aliens are playing with. Um, but I believe in energy transfer and I believe that us as people talk about like a fifth element and I believe that that's love and that attraction that we have for one another. Boy, I'm so glad I so. asked you that question. <laughs> Jackpot. Yeah. That's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. You gotta learn it. You just do learning through turmoil and tribulations that everything will be okay. But as long as you have love and passion and continue to give good energy, I think everything always works out. We're here to enjoy ourselves and have a great time. We are happy to be alive. Yeah. Right. And I think I got that from the military too, seeing so many things happen to people, young people, uh, that after I got out of there, I think I was about 21 or 22. It's like, you know what? I'm alive. I'm going to take advantage of this <laughs> and and really have a good time and be happy. You look pretty happy. I'm, I, I never complain. <laughs> Hardly ever. <laughs> We're all born and we all strive. This is an ever-changing world and an ever-changing people. And we're here just to be part of that change and that evolution. It's like maybe, to me, it's like a goldfish bowl experiment. And some big guys sitting there going like, look what they're doing now. And so I think, you know, our purpose. You know, it's really interesting that you ask that because um, my husband asked me that on our first dinner date. And I was able to somehow just answer. Like, I don't really know where the answer came from, but it's true. And now I frequently share it with my kids, which is, I believe that we are all here to contribute to society in one way, shape, or form. And hopefully this is something my kids will learn from and do as well. And that can mean a lot of different things. That could mean, um, you know, having a business where you are contributing by making something that the world needs. It could be that you have a business and you're providing jobs to people. It could be that you're working in a business. It could be that you're a mom and you're committed to raising the, you know, being CEO of the household, which is not just raising the kids, but it's like running the whole household, right? Or it could be that you're a volunteer and you're doing service work and doing something to change the world. But To me, um, I'm a big believer in not staying idle and contributing in some way. And I hope that my kids learn that and will do something, whatever it is with their passion, but will contribute to society in that way. You know, it's interesting because everybody has a different answer to that question, obviously. And some people answer it in more of a, what does it mean to me, you know? And 
that is so beautiful. Everything you said was about giving back and how you can be of service. And you can see that in who you are. It's clearly who you are. Thank so you I love saying. that. <laughs> I think we're here to serve humanity. Mm. And I, I think being of service is the highest calling. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that you'll always find me doing is, is asking, you know, how can I help? Well, it's, uh, Lisa definitely did a lot of that in her interview and talked about giving back. And it's so interesting how you look at people that seem to have so much and you would think that their life would be spent just very self-focused, you know, like, okay, I've done all this and I've gotten all this and now I'm just going to kick back and have fun. And to see people who have accomplished so much still focused on what they can do for others and giving back is such a powerful statement. And I've really seen that over and over and over in the guests that we've had on. And it's really opened my eyes to the importance of that. And um, I think it's part of what makes people great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that uh, if you're never, like if you have a day where you're somehow like off kilter or whatever, the best way to get back in alignment is to do something for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, man, I don't remember where I read it, but somebody a long time ago told me, it was something along the line of like, 30 minutes is a lot of time. Um, there is so much time in the day to do things and we waste so much time doing things like on our phone and whatnot. If you schedule like 30 minutes a day to pick up a hobby or an activity, like in one year, you can be at like a 99th percentile proficiency. You can be really, really, really good at some particular thing if you set aside some time to it. So you don't have to be like ultra regimenting your schedule. Like at 9.30, I do this. At 9.42, I do this. At 9.50, right? But like having like, you know, um, every 20 minutes I wake up and I read a book instead of reading my phone. Um, I think making little changes like that, you can find there's a whole bunch of time in your day that you can find if you actually schedule it out. God, that's such a great piece of advice. I hope all you kids are listening to this. If I could give a life piece of advice to kids, it doesn't matter what I say because I'll never listen to it. Because I know that, I've always said this, if I could go back in time and talk to myself yeah. and I knew that it was me from the future, I still wouldn't listen to it. <laughs> Try harder in school. Oh my God. Just study or work a little bit more in school. There's no excuse, man. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of smart kids, I think, that just don't study enough. They don't put enough effort in. And you don't, you don't realize how much you've messed up until you're like, really until you're working a job. It's one of the reasons why I wish you could like make kids work jobs like for one year before college. So it's like, okay, well, if you don't do well in school or whatever, this is what the rest of your life could be like. You know, you might be doing this thing that doesn't give you all the freedom and everything you want. So yeah, try hard in it school. It is so true. And I think for a lot of people that drop out of college, once they get into the work world, they decide to go back because then they actually appreciate what mm -hmm. learning is a, is a wonderful opportunity, I always say. For sure. There's, there are things in life that mature you very quickly. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is when you have to get up, you have to go to a job that you don't want to because if you don't, you can't pay your bills. Right. <laughs> that experience like changes a person. And yeah, there's a really old quote. And every year I get older, it's, uh, I, I find it rings more true. And that's youth is wasted on the young. That's because you don't really realize, you know, yeah, what, what everything in life is until you're out of school. And it's like, man, there's so many things I would have done differently had I known, you know. Yeah, that's so true. Oh, my gosh. You're so wise for your, for your young age. How old are you? 33. 33? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sure. Um, I'm very close with my family. So I would say, you know, we didn't have much growing up, but we had love and we had uh, closeness. And my mom and dad are, struggled so much to support my, me and my sister. One thing my dad told me as I was probably was a little punk and getting in trouble for something. Uh, my dad said, you're only as good as your word. So no matter what you have possession wise or what you can do, if you're only as good as your loyalty and what you say you're going to do. So from that, it's always stuck with me that if I commit to something, this is going to happen. It's an expectation and I follow through with it. Um, I'll give you a couple examples on that. Uh, kind of a, a funny, stupid example. But, you know, we talk about Los Angeles and Hollywood and a lot of people being aloof. Whenever I get invited to something, I show up. And people are like, what are you doing here? And it's like, well, I told you I was coming. So I, I, I follow through. I, I'm not big on canceling plans uh, by any means, but... I also, you know, may not commit to some things either <laughs> because it's like, hey, if I commit, I'm going to be there. Right. Um, you know, even being a part of the show, I'm so thankful. But like, you made a commitment, like yeah. follow through on that. So you only as good as your you word. Appreciate you showing up, man. Yeah, no, I will, I will forever. So if I tell somebody I'm going to do something, you got to follow through. I think the work ethic, you know, the Cal Ripken Sr., you know, who was, you know, you got to understand Cal Ripken Sr. was a guy that wanted to be a catcher. He's 
you know, Cal's 6'4", played all those games, 2,632 consecutive. Hall of Fame, over 400 home runs, 3,000 hits, you know, gold clubs and all. His dad hurt his shoulder and became a manager at like 28. Mm. So he was, you know, I had him in A-ball, I had him in instructional league, and kind of taught me baseball. But the work ethic and the, the fact, I mean, when somebody tells you there are no such things as shortcuts, and then you end up playing 20 years and you see how many talented people out there have had similar ability to you, yet they don't want to work as hard, mm-hmm. or they did take shortcuts. I'm not saying that, you know, that maybe I didn't maybe cut off a corner every once in a while, but um, it was just, you, when, when you, it's so much easier to look in the mirror than when you lose a baseball game knowing, you know what, hey, I did everything I could yeah. do to win. Right. And you're going to lose because it's a team game, and sometimes the other team's more scores, more runs, or the other pitcher's better, you know. Or when you play in a World Series, like when we lost to the Mets or the Pirates, great series, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, the two Pirates series, seven games, 71 and 79. I don't know if they outplayed us, but they won, and they did it fair and square. And so I think, uh, you know, again, the fact that you do everything you can to win, and, you know, and you don't ever let anybody outwork you, and then you don't take the shortcuts, probably the best advice I ever had. Yeah, well, that's great advice to everybody, I think, for and sure. And we're a jockey, of course. And we're a jockey. It's comfort. Boxes of briefs. <laughs> Do you ever watch Seinfeld? Yeah. Yeah. You, you have more room for the boys when you wear with boxers. With boxers, but I wear briefs. There you go. And I've never been a boxer. I'm sure guy. Susan appreciates that. I, I don't know about that. My dad told me that if you're working for somebody else, you're never going to make any money. Mm. And then I figured that out later when I was in, working in advertising. I mean, in advertising, you're making millions and millions of dollars through these other guys and their other companies. And I went, I can do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll just take what I like to do and I can advertise it because yeah. I know how to do that so, or market it or whatever. So uh, that's one of the things. And I think that's where uh, Wyland and I kind of connected. Mm-hmm. We've always kind of been in control of our publishing, uh, our, you know, if you have a gallery, buy the land. If uh, we've always kind of, we haven't really given it out to other people. We do license stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I license uh, my images to uh, a rum company in Hawaii, and we've done like gold jewelry and you know sculptures and statues and that kind of stuff. So that's a whole different kind of a, a thing where they take your image and use it on their product, and they make a lot of money with it, and you get a small royalty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you get enough of those, now hopefully they make a lot of money with it. Yeah, they, they do. <laughs> yeah, it's oh good my if you god! Can get yeah, it, it's right? like how, how come we don't have this business? Why right? do we let them do it? Yeah. <laughs> so my mom told me when I first started working to be flexible, be mm-hmm. flexible in business, and you know at that time she said we as women like things a certain way. We like them, you know, very organized. We kind of think of them in a box and. Men sometimes aren't like that. Men will look at things from different perspectives. And the biggest thing that you could, the best thing that you could do as a woman in business is to remain flexible and change with things. And I think over time, I've interpreted that as the ability to, you know, do things from an operation standpoint and get into the weeds when I need to, but be able to bounce up to that 30,000 foot level where you can look at things strategically. Mm-hmm. And it's, sometimes I feel it's like exercise where you bounce back and forth before the, between those two levels. It's so good for your brain. And um, sometimes that's where the best ideas come from. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Well, and it's like every time, every day that we wake up, we're, we're a new person, right? Because mm-hmm. we've grown from the experiences of yesterday and we've kind of reprojected about what we want. So you always have to kind of be reanalyzing things. It's it's like my mom told me when I was little, keep tasting the same foods that you don't like because uh-huh. your taste buds constantly change. So maybe that'll be your, your next favorite food. That's true. Right? I had a vice president of my board at the Aspen Art Museum named Domenico de Soleil. He was the chairman of or CEO, rather, of Gucci, the chairman of Tom Ford. And he said to me, you can never thank people too often. And that is true. Wow, I love that one. Well, my dad sent me away to military school, so he said, stay away from women. (laughs) So I always remember that. (laughs) Whether you followed it or not is another story. I didn't follow it, but (laughs) I was 15 at the time. I think the biggest issue on the planet right now is that we live in, I'm going to use the phrase, different epistemic realities. Um, Mm. The way that people 
figure out like what's true or false is just totally different. And I think the scariest thing that you run into is when you hit a divide like this, you can't communicate anymore. And then the divides will grow bigger and bigger. Um, I think that when you have a group of people together that have some level of disagreement, there's, there's like a tension there that I think is good because it keeps everybody at least a little bit grounded. Um, and when you, when everybody separates, cause they can't talk to each other anymore, you just, you totally lose that. And then both sides fly off into crazy directions and it, yeah, it inhibits conversation. Oftentimes people will ask about like, you know, oh, the American political system, it's so messed up, you know, Congress is broken and blah, blah, blah. I actually think our political system is really effective. I think it's like almost perfect in some ways. It's designed really well. And when people look at things like Congress and they go, okay, well, why isn't Congress passing any legislation if it works so well? Well, it's because historically we are ultra divided um, as a country. And I think Congress reflects that. We can't get any big legislation out of Congress because we genuinely have huge disagreements between half the population about the direction the country should take. So. I think it's the fact that people don't see our connection, you know, between people. And as uh, politics and uh, you can go out and say religion, um, the media sort of drive people apart. It's the exact opposite direction that I think we need to be going mm-hmm. and getting out and, you know, talking to people, having face-to-face exchanges, you know, the travel, meeting their kids, you know, um, having that human interaction, I think is the most critical thing because at the end of the conversations or the interactions, you realize that we're all just doing our very best, you know, in the world, having our challenges and um, that the only way we're going to do it is together. You know, no individual, no corporation, no uber wealthy person is going to make it happen. It's Mm -hmm. everybody. And, uh, you know, as we become a a global uh, economy, there's all these, you know, connections with uh, social media, um, satellite communication, you know, business, uh, global challenges like the plastics and the the oceans or pollution. One of the experiments that I carried on the uh, citizen of the world was testing for plastic particles in the atmosphere because they found them in the, all the water, you know, bodies of water uh, on all the land, even at the poles, but nobody's ever tested the air. Mm-hmm. So that was the first time it's ever been tested. And it just shows that everything is connected. What'd they find? Or what'd you find, I should say? Well, they're still finishing the test, but the... Uh, initial tests show that there's microfibers in the air and we have them in our bodies too. We breathe them in. Um, and a lot of our clothes, you know, that have the plastics are the source for that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, the environment's connecting us as well. I feel that we've gotten weak as a society. Um, you know, I believe in gender roles. I believe in men and women. And I believe that there are things that you possess that there I can't physically do. It, but vice versa, it goes both ways. And I bring the gender role up because I believe it goes back to the transfer of energy and kind of how we evolved as um, a civilization, as, as a species, that um, I believe we've gotten soft. And my biggest issue with society today is the first interaction where something um, doesn't go your way, people complain, and then just give up and don't do it. Mm. And I can name countless times as we were planning Blended that we very easily could have given up. Mm-hmm. Not having funding, not uh, going, finding the city, not having the artists commit, not having tickets getting sold, but we kept pushing and kept striving. And I think it goes back to that mental toughness that if you just tell your mind, this is going to happen and we're going to do it, we will survive. I think our society needs to get tough again. And I don't know if, if every the whole planet is going to get killed off and we have to start from scratch and we have to learn how to farm our own food or kill our own food to consume it then that's what needs to happen. But uh, Mike Tyson has the best quote. You know, everyone's got a plan until you get punched right in the face. And I feel like a lot more people need to get punched in the face, to be honest. (laughs) And so I think we just gotten weak and we've got to get tougher. And that's how we survive. Because all these little meaningless things don't matter. And there's such a division in politics and division on race. Like, why? Like, let's get together. And I understand we all have our issues. We all have our things where we grew up. I have my triggers, trust me, where I grew up. And... uh, in the area there, I have triggers for sure. But having that toughness, those meaningless things go away. And it's, you know, playing football, it's the ultimate team sport. It doesn't matter what race, where you're from, how good you are, what you look like. It matters, can you play? And are we doing this together? Mm -hmm. And it's 
because having that that shape from the ultimate team game to life is let's survive as one. So I think that's our biggest issue today. There you go. You know, I mean, I suppose, you know, it's funny, Susan's, uh, Susan's uh, uncle went to MIT and Naval Academy. So uh, every time they bring up global warming, he goes, you know, so I, I can't go to global warming. Um, you know, political unrest, the fact that we don't, we don't get along, especially in this country. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny, if, if you play on a baseball team, you, you know, you have, now they have, well, we used to have 10 pitchers, now they have 13, 14. So you have your pitchers and then you have your, your, your catchers and your regular, you know, your fielders and your outfielders. But you're a team. Mm-hmm. I get the feeling in this country, we're not a team mm-hmm. anymore. No, you know, the, the, you know, the Democrats and the, Repo- the Republicans, they don't, regardless of what size you're, mm-hmm. you know, you know, they just don't like each other and they yeah. have their own agendas. And, um, you know, we used to have a saying in baseball, you know, when we would, and again, when you play on a team that had the best winning percentage, you know, when we'd get a guy that would come over, we usually pick pretty good players, but you know, you used to had Orioles on the front and then you had your name on the back. And I'm, and I'm not exaggerating. You could always tell when a player played on a losing team because they didn't really care much about this. Mm. They cared about what their, their name on the back. Mm. You could always tell the difference between a winner and a loser yeah. because he played for the, you know, the losers played for the name on their back because that's, that was okay. Mm. And I feel like in this country now, it's okay, you know, you know, not to see what's best for this country. Mm. And it's very frustrating. Especially when, you know, I mean, you know, my daughters are in their 50s now, but, you know, I have grandkids. Henry and Maxine are down in Texas and, you know, I mean, Spencer's only 25. I mean, you want, you want the best for your kids. So hopefully we'll be able to um, get a little bit better. And I think the other thing, the pandemic, taught us some great lessons about being, mm. you know, we were oil in, independent. And I remember years ago, my great grandmother said, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't want to ha- buy some stock that when some sheik in, in uh, Saudi Arabia stands up and says, we're cutting off the tap, that the market goes down or whatever the case is. Well, you know, we kind of went from being oil independent to not being, and I think we're paying the price. And we learned that you know, a lot of the things that we used to make, we no longer make. So we're more dependent mm-hmm. on other countries. And um, sometimes other countries don't like us. Yeah. Big concern. We need to change that. Now, how we're going to do that. Could you work on that for us? Well, well that'll be interview number two. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Well, I go, I, we're go, let's go back to the Washington Press Club. <laughs> I only want to be the mayor of Juno Beach. That's the only <laughs> politics I want to get into. So I think that today we could look at things in kind of two different levels. Of course, internationally with the whole Ukraine-Russia conflict that I think is very much at the top of everyone's minds right now. I think domestically, um, you know, we're coming out of COVID where the income disparity between the haves and the haves not is greater than it's ever been Mm -hmm. before. And it's it's something that as we, you know, the as the middle class shrinks away, it becomes, I think, worse and worse for our yeah. country. So it's like, how do we feel that? How do we solve for that? I, I feel like a lot of the, the social impact work that we're doing is helping solve for that because we're providing jobs, we're starting businesses. You know, I when I track um what we're doing from social impact, it's on a few different levels, whether it's like, are we putting Wi-Fi in an area? Are there parks in this certain area mm-hmm. where we're building real estate? So I think um, whatever we can do to help close that gap and lift people up, you know, coming out of COVID, mm-hmm. that's very pressing in our country. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you just reminded me of something. I, um, I read re- that one of the things that people were falling back on during the pandemic was um, nature. Mm -hmm. and how nature is so grounding and so peaceful to us. And I spent a lot of time in Denver, and Denver was kind of a new place, and they just didn't have any greenery. So they started giving people incentives to put uh, rooftop gardens. Hmm. And now when you look out over Denver, you see all these beautiful rooftop gardens. So put rooftop gardens in where you go. Oh, my gosh. That's a great idea. Why don't we make more use of rooftop spaces, right? Right. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Just saying. Especially for this, what is it in Ayurvedic medicine? It's the... The pittas who like that, mm-hmm. who like being around the forest and greenery and yeah. it soothes their souls. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure Nelson could talk for us about that. <laughs> Putin and Russia. That's very I'm, prevalent I'm, I'm right now. I'm afraid somebody's going to use the nuclear weapon. 
Mm. And all hell is going to break loose. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but we'll see. I, uh, I'll be completely honest, because uh, I've grown up a little bit different. Um, it's really hard, depending on where you're at in life or what you're doing, to not get kind of like a superiority complex. One of the biggest changes that I've made to my own personal thoughts is rather than seeing different like ways of functioning as lesser or worse, I just try to view it as different. And I think it lets me uh, associate or relate to people in a lot more of a healthy way. Yeah. So I'm like a very, I'm a very cold kind of like factual, like this and that and that and that kind of person. And for a long time, especially in my early 20s, if I ran across more emotionally driven people, I'd be like, okay, well, you're a loser. You're dumb. Why can't you just think a little bit recently? But now I try to view people as like being a little bit different. Like, okay, well, this person thinks things differently. I'm probably missing out on some aspects of life because I'm not as emotionally driven. Um, but I see how this person does it. And I try to like uh, engage with it in a better way than just thinking like, oh, I'm so much better than you. You know? That's awesome. A lot of the spiritual teachers teach that. Mm -hmm. They said to go through life with, um, to observe, but not judge. Because as soon as you judge something, you have to attach a part of yourself to it. It's okay. black or white, right or wrong. It, you, you're, you're holding on to it. Mm -hmm. If you observe something and let it pass through you, then it, there's no obligation to you. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a very freeing way to go about life, I think. For sure. And everybody has like probably something that you can learn from or take from Absolutely. that would benefit you in some way. Yeah. No, that's so true. And to your point, you've changed so much in your way of thinking. How do you know that later in life, you actually wouldn't finally adopt that way of thinking too? So you might be judging yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, it's simultaneously a good experience and a bad experience. But like every like two to three years, I'll look back on some stuff I believed and I'll be like, oh my God, I was so cringe. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I also, the, the biggest worry I have in life actually is that I would get to like 45 or something and I'd look back and I'm like, you know, I believe every single thing I believed when I was 35 because I'd be worried that like, well, I wonder if I'm not growing or changing in a way that I should be. So I absolutely think that would be an indicator of that. Possibly. Yeah. Sure. yeah. There's a lot of like an early. <laughs> I hate saying this, um, but in school, especially, you hear a lot of things, your parents that are whatever, and then you get to high school and college and you realize a lot of what they said was really dumb and wrong. And then you get out of college and high school and you're like, okay, actually, maybe they were correct on more things than I realized, but you kind of like need the learned experience to kind of connect to what they were saying sometimes. So it's, yeah. It's so true. Uh, thankfully, Arist often says now, you are right again. Yeah. Not that they're right on everything, though. No. Well, especially boomer parents. They, there's a lot of really dumb things they say. So, you know, it's, so it, it's a hit or miss thing, it's you know, so true. which is why you got to learn through experience. You got to yeah. learn through experience. It's uh, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I used to believe some of the stories that I told myself as a kid. And I actually just learned this the other day. You know, when I was going through high school, uh, I had this expectation of what my life would be, you know, what, what I would accomplish. Um, and by most standards, I, I thought it would just be kind of an average life. And I don't feel like it's been that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then you realize, well, 50, you know, well, since high school, maybe 40 some years, and I was living with that belief. You know, I believed the story that I told myself and it was not true. So I think it's important for us to define ourselves by who we are right now. And I, you know, recently moved up to the Pacific Northwest and it was a fantastic thing to do because you start your life over again because people meet you and they know you now. They don't know who you were 10 years ago when you were, you know, tackling gang members and doing citizens arrests or some of the mistakes you made, but you know, the person that you've evolved to today. So I think it's important to leave those stories behind. And, um, you know, there's a saying, if you're going to tell yourself a story, you might as well make it a good one. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yeah. Something I used to believe and I don't anymore. I used to believe that we were born sinful, that we were sinful people by birth, just sinners. And I don't believe that anymore. I believe that sin is a nature. And I believe that we could actually live a life that's sin-free. That's not mistake-free. But it's, I believe that we can live a life that is uh, righteous. And I don't believe that just we're just born that way. I believe we make decisions throughout our life um, that may classify us that way. But I believe that we can make intentional decisions every day um, to deny ourselves of making decisions that are hurtful, not only to us, but to others. You're deep, man. <laughs> I love it. Sure. So this is going to be a hard one for me to, to say, but I 
giving the viewers a master in your question. So um, I was a very staunch uh, Catholic, the way I was raised, being an Italian Catholic uh, here. And religion was a big part for me. And, you know, while I believe the Bible is a story to tell people one things to believe, I believe all religions are somewhat accurate, right? And just how you translate them. Um, so because of that, there were certain things throughout my life that I had extra value in that um, I don't necessarily have the same amount. I won't say value, but just uh, thought process on this can or can't happen. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, you follow certain strict rules like, <clears throat> not allowed to drink or have it make love or have intercourse or do those types of things where now I'm just, I believe in transfer of energy and I believe in being a good person. And I also believe in communication and there's different forms of communication. There's verbal, there's body language, there's touch. I'm a huge person on the love languages as well too. And so what's your love language? Uh, touch hundred <laughs> percent. So, you and 80% of men. <laughs> I mean, that's, but I also love to give acts of service. So I'm big on gift giving and doing things for people. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring Blended to the world. Right. Um, so uh, I'm more on, I believe, in communication and energy transfer now, where I think that that's needed. That's how you get to know and learn somebody, where I didn't think there were those things in the past. Mm. So Very cool. <laughs> Media. You know, it's fun. It's, I mean, I saw it a little bit in baseball. You'd have writers come up to you. I was on the Phil Donahue show, and um, there was a guy named Milton Richmond. He, he, he wrote for you, the you know the United the AP. So he was all over the country, and he asked me a question in New York, pitched against the Yankees in Yankee Stadium, and he goes, "Am I understanding what you say?" And I said, "Excuse me." He said, "I've never had a writer say that." He said, "No, I just want to get it right. I want to know if what you're saying is the way it really was." So I go and I'm in Chicago and. Doing stuff for Jockey, and I did the Phil Donahue show. And he asked me, he asked me, he said, you know, ask me about writers. And I said, well, yeah, you know, writers usually they have preconceived notions about what they want to write. They don't always listen. It's they're already going on a, their tangent before, mm -hmm. and they're going to take it out of context. And it's going to they're going to mold your words into what, you know, what the what their storyline is. Kind of, you know. And so, of course, Milton Richmond wrote me a little note saying, you know, I don't watch Phil Donahue, but I, my friends do. Thank you so much, you know, for saying nice things about me. And you probably know that I vote for the Hall of Fame. Mm. Wish I didn't, but yeah, yeah. but I just said it because it was the first time it ever happened. Now you, you know, you turn on television or you watch stuff and you go, okay, they say stuff they're not accountable for. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, know what to yeah, right. And, you know, same with our laws. I mean, I thought we had laws because they were laws, but law, the definition of laws changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny, um, when, when I played, and, and you know you you know you're when and shot youngs and all that you're the guy that's supposed to lead the band you're supposed to be the orchestra leader mm -hmm. and i had this love hate relationship with Earl weaver my manager and i you know i wrote book wrote two books you know the nine inches of success but i wrote a book called with jim dale called together we were 11 foot nine because i was six three and in row was five six and we both ended up in the hall of fame but um i used to uh sit in the first row of bulkhead with a left-handed pitcher who did win one Cy Young, Mike Flanagan. And, you know, Mike uh, Mike told me a story. He says, you know, I know you don't get along with Earl. You have this love-hate relationship. He puts the ball in your locker every four days. You win, but he never shakes your hand. And he doesn't want you to like him because then it will make his job harder and all that. But uh, he said, you know, you pitched five innings in spring training last year. And he called me over. It was my first year on the Major League roster in spring training in Miami. And he said, See that guy out there? He says, you do what he does and you'll never have a problem in the big leagues. Now, that's the ultimate ultimate compliment for your manager to say, but Earl was never going to say that to me. So years later, Earl gets in the Hall of Fame and, uh, you know, it's the night before the induction and we're going over to the, the museum at Cooperstown for, and, you know, Earl's sitting with some friends and having a couple of drinks and, you know, I, he was closing in on 80 and I couldn't make fun of him anymore because, you know, he wasn't quite as sharp. So I said, Earl, I said, you know, um, I said, Mike Flanagan, I said, you really like me. You know, you pretended you didn't like me all those years. Uh, but I said, no, Mike Flanagan told me what you told him about, you know, just do what he does. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll never have a problem. He goes, I told them all that. So, you know, here's a guy, you know, Earl was telling me, something and, and whatever so, but you could you could kind of believe what was going on and but now I don't know what to believe mm -hmm. you know you don't you just don't know you know and so 
uh, we need to, we, we need to, we have some work to do. And it just doesn't seem like it's getting any better. Um, when I, when I first started, when I first got into art, I thought that it would be a nice, happy place and that kind of thing. And when you get into the business side of it, there are people that will do, do want to, will take advantage of you if you let them. Uh, and so to me, one of the things that I really didn't expect was to have to defend my copyrights and my intellectual property rights with some major, major companies. Uh, and we've we've had to kind of go through that a, a lot of times because it's so successful that other people just, and they don't ask. You know, if you ask, we'll like, sure, we'll, we'll work with you. But um, they'll just kind of take off with it and, and, and do that. And having to go back in and and kind of defend your copyright or defend your creativity and your intellectual property uh, was was kind of uh, not just a shock, but it's really stressful too mm-hmm. to have to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, so that was something I, yeah. <laughs> the uh, what would be first and foremost in my mind is I was brought up in a religious. I went to a Catholic school. I was an altar boy not molested, but I was an altar boy. And um, when I look back, sorry for anybody that's a Catholic out there, but when I look back at what I was taught in those days, the mass was spoken in Latin. Mm. So we would sit there and not know anything about what was happening. Mm. And then we would go into school and we would learn about if you don't go to confession during you know Lent, you're excommunicated, or if you eat meat on Friday, you go to hell. I mean, or if you're born and you don't get baptized, you're going to go to limbo. I mean, things that when I think back about, maybe they don't teach those now, I don't know. But in those days, they 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 were like scare tactics to get mm-hmm. you to do what it is they wanted you to do, which was become baptized and, you know, toe the line. So all of that belief system I don't believe anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've, I developed a spiritual aspect to my life and it certainly is close to being religious, but it doesn't have the dogma of any one particular religion. You know, I think that the old adage, you can't keep, teach an old dog new tricks. I don't believe that. I think I used to think that that was just, you know, I took it as what it was. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. And I've come to believe that really the mind is the most powerful thing that we have and can really uh, accomplish or change anything. And in some of the work that I'm doing right now, um, sorry, the personal work with the coach, with with coach Dr. Aaron, I've learned that I've always been one where like mindset is very important. My mom Mm -hmm. is like that. My mom literally could get like cancer or COVID and she will not because she will be like, no, I'm not sick. I'm well. Mm -hmm. And she will like, well, she will like use her mind to well her into health. (laughs) I believe that. Absolutely. Um, But I believe it's even beyond that. I think that people who have chronic illnesses, and it's not like it solves everything, but I believe there's so much that can be accomplished if you just put your mind to it and focus and change your mindset. I so believe that too. (laughs) I love that. That the opinions of other people about you matter. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. I think women especially, we, we tend to be very concerned about what other people think about us. Yeah. So that's powerful. Is there an issue that you think is something that is keeping you up at night or something that we should be worried about? Yeah, climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my boyfriend is super concerned about climate change, founded a business to address it. And oh, wow. it is uh, something that we think a lot about and talk a lot about and think that the world would benefit from having more urgency ar- around and, you know, we live in a coastal community, so yeah. it's really something I think we could spend a little more time thinking about. So what's the business? How can we help? <laughs> what can we do? Absolutely. The business is called Ando Money, mm-hmm. and it is the first sustainable bank. And you can join and put your money there. And not only each time do you, uh, when you use it, you get money back, and you can round up and buy a tree with each one of your purchases. So I have already 
um, graduated into the third grouping of tree planting, and so I've already planted like an orchard. And wow. uh, yeah, carbon offsets from that, and it's a genius idea. Yeah, so it's all online. There's no yep. physical locations. Exactly. Ando Bank. Ando Money. Ando Money. Mm -hmm. Ando Money. Okay, mm -hmm. very cool. Well, yep. Thanks for sharing that with us. I used to believe that people could get along, but uh, ever since I went to Vietnam, I don't believe that anymore. Mm. I, I just, I want to, but it just doesn't happen. What did uh, what did you learn about the world or your, about yourself when you went to Vietnam? Oh, life is precious. Uh, when you're out in the jungle, you you don't know if you're going to live or die. Uh, it's uh, it was quite an experience, quite an experience. Still, I had it down. I, Eleven months, twenty eight days. I had it down to hours and minutes that I, that I was there, but it's been so long. Uh, came home in 1969, uh, uh, and then that was one of the things. I, my daughter was born one month after I went to Vietnam, mm. and I asked so the I asked the government, "Let me stay one more month for my daughter to be born." And, nope, you got to go. And I hated the government for doing that. Mm. I even wrote the president and uh, President Bush at the time. I wrote him a letter saying, don't ever send anybody to war unless you're prepared to use a nuclear weapon. Otherwise, life is too valuable. There's no need. You know, If you're prepared to use a nuclear weapon, then we're in trouble. But don't send, it, don't send us to war anymore. We lost 55,000 guys in Vietnam and women. Um, I would love to be a, the best father in the world. I am not a father yet, um, but I would love to have children. And uh, I want to care for my kids just like my dad did for me and my sister and give them the world. And not only give them things, but give them knowledge, things that I've learned. The reason why I go and do all these things is I want to be able to look my kids in the face and say, you can be whatever you want mm -hmm. and show them like all these stories. Um, I love the, sh the movie Big Fish how uh, the dad's on his dying bed and he tells all these stories and the son hates it. He's like, you're always trying to one up, you're telling all these stories. But then you come to find out the end of the movie, like the stories are all like somewhat true. Sure, they're a little yeah. fabricated, but they're all like real. Mm -hmm. And he finally realizes that at his funeral. And I love the idea of being able to, to say that to children. So that's first and foremost, um, love the opportunity to do that and, and continue, you know, the bloodline and, and the family. But um, Professionally, um, my expectation in life, because I don't believe in goals, expectations, I expect well, to own an NFL team. So since wow, I was a little kid. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I've always 100% wanted to be an owner of an NFL team. I'm a diehard Los Angeles Rams fan. Um, got the chance to meet Stan Kroenke, uh, hung out with him. Super cool guy. He's like my business idol. A lot of people have like Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, like Stan Kroenke has been my guy that I've tried to, to base some things off of. And and really go for it. So professionally, I'd love to own an NFL team, specifically the Los Angeles Rams. So I know our value is going through the roof, but love to get some people together and, and hopefully when Stan's ready to go, we can buy the team from him. So Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have no doubt you're going to accomplish those hey, goals. I don't know. You know, that's a good point. Um, you know, when I was young, I did a lot of work with cystic fibrosis. Uh, you know, Susan and I used to do a lot of fundraising for autism because, you know, you know, we kind of live in the world of autism with Spencer. It's, you know, like I said, he's such a kind, gentle, smart, brilliant, but, you know, photographic memory type of kid. So we certainly like to make a difference. Um, in other words, I just, you know, I think it's, it's amazing how people look up to you when, you know, you, you, I always used to say, you know, they say, you know, you used to be one of the great, you know, maybe you're one of the best pitchers ever, blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah, tell them who I used to be. But you still are that person. So... When you meet people, I mean, I, you know, I had people that um, told me that, you know, in the same amount of time it takes to be rude to somebody, you can be nice to them. So I think when you are who, who I am or just happen to be, I think you still have, um, I don't know, I guess, you know, you, you still have to be kind to people and you have to be generous with your time and, and whatever. You know, now you, you know, maybe you do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. The older you get, the more friends you leave you lose, you know, just lost another sports editor and 
it's amazing how you, by being nice to people in an airport or maybe a little bit harder now because we're all masked people. You know, that's the great thing about being older. You didn't get to wear a mask. Nobody knows how you look. <laughs> you know, do you ever get the feeling we all could be... Larry? I can I can go out without makeup on now. Well, well, yeah, but we could be Larry David over the last two years. I don't know if you ever watched Curb Your Enthusiasm, but Larry David says whatever comes to his mind. Yeah. I mean, he's hysterical. Yeah, you know, he yeah. wrote the Seinfeld stuff, but this has been two years where nobody really knows who you are <laughs> when you have your mask on. But I think the fact that... Um, I don't know. Maybe I, 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 you know, I'm going to keep broadcasting. I'm going to keep, you know, I, it, the Orioles are not a very good team, but the way the system is kind of tanking, they've got number one draft choices two out of the last three years. So they're trying to get better and hopefully I'll still be there when they do, because it would be nice to be part of something that, that, that I was able to be part to of. Build, yeah. yeah. So every year I don't do resolutions, but I do do goals. So I look back at my iPad and I have them like so many years back with the goals for the year. And my goal for this year, 2022, is self-care. Mm. Um, you know, we as moms put everybody else in front of us, all of our kids, our spouse. Um, work is work ha has always been a priority of mine. And I've decided that actually this is the year of me. So I've been, that's also probably why I've been diligent with my practices um, and doing certain things. Like even the other day, I was like, oh, I have tennis on Thursday morning. Should I cancel it so I can get more work done? I'm like, no, self-care, self-care, mm -hmm. self-care. <laughs> so that's really a goal for me right now. I love that. You know, I have something similar. I do, um, I pick a, a new word every year. Mm. And I always ask my friends, what is your word for this year? What is your word for this year? So my word for this year was abundance. Oh. Um, and it, it got delivered to me in a meditation. And I was like, oh, okay, clearly it's supposed to be my word. But it's so funny. It's like, as soon as the year turned over, like, I mean, things have just been coming in waves. I mean, I've had, you know, all of these new guests and new opportunities and new dates. And I was like, this word's paying off. I'm yeah. so happy I picked abundance. So. You did, and you probably manifested it, right? too. I absolutely believe I did. Yes. Yeah, and so March is supposed to be my my money, my money month for money. So I'll check back. I'll let you know. That for March. I keep seeing <laughs> right? things that March is supposed to be the money month. This Let's all hope month, for that, right? <laughs> we need a uh, name for the Orange County Museum of Art. We need to have the building named. Oh. Have not yet achieve that goal. Really? Yep. Well, don't they just usually name it after a big donor or something? Exactly. It's a yeah. $25 million opportunity, and I'm yeah. looking to close that. Yes. Okay, people, step right up. Get your chance. Get your name on the building. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. I think people look at me now that I meet, and they see the run for governor. They see the successful company, they see our family and they probably think he comes, he comes from success or he comes from wealth or, you know, it, it got handed to him. But when I started the company, like a year before I started the company and we had two small, well, she was actually pregnant at the time, my wife, we were eating hamburger helper without the meat because we couldn't afford the ground beef. So we were in an apartment, hamburger helper, no ground beef. Our coffee table was a cardboard box. Our sofa was a kid's sofa that she had brought with her that she had had since she was 10 years old. Our dining table was a plastic dining table from Thrifties, which is now Rite Aid, but those plastic outdoor dining sets, was that was our dining table. And our refrigerator was gifted to us. It was somebody's refrigerator from the garage. It didn't even work half the time. Those were our humble beginnings. We had nothing. Electricity constantly being turned off. I remember our very first car was a Honda Civic. The first week we had it, I crashed the hood. The insurance company sent us a $900 check to fix it. And it was really fix the car or eat, fix the car or eat. Five years we had that car and when we turned it back in, it still had the dent on it because we had not made enough money to actually fix it. So 20 years later, my life is different now, but it came with a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard, hard work sleepless nights. And I don't know that people would look at me now and understand that that was where I started. So that was probably something most people wouldn't know. Well, probably the adoption aspect. You know, when I used to do speaking, 
you know, I'd always say that I was adopted and I kind of lucked out because I had great parents and, uh, you know, remember when I was born in this country, you know, yeah. the president of the Hall of Fame used to talk about the ovarian lottery, which is that you, you were born in the United States. So I had great parents. Um, I, I've walked on fire in Tahiti. I've delivered five babies. Okay, I where used, does that mean you've delivered I, five I used babies? to be a medic uh, in, uh, yeah, in, uh, I was a uh, Navy medic, but I ended up with the Marines. And wow, that's I very cool. I delivered my own daughter later. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I was uh, a medic, so I've got a lot of bad, bad war stories. <laughs> that's very cool. I don't know. I kind of like that. Yeah. Good, good person to hang around. Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> um... I think the one that usually surprises people if I share it is the fact that I was born in the front seat of my grandmother's green Ford Mustang in the emergency zone in front of Hogue Hospital. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm sure that your mom's got a story about that. Yeah, we never quite made it in. And I wrote my college entrance essay about how I was different from the beginning because I wasn't allowed in the nursery with the other kids. They wouldn't allow you in the nursery? No. Back then, it was considered like an unsterile birth. So I was with my mom. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Number one, that I'm that religious. Most of them think I'm crazy. But uh, <laughs> that's that's about it. Everybody knows everything about me. I, I just I, found out that you have a Bloody Mary every morning. <laughs> every single morning, I have a cup of coffee and a Bloody Mary. Dr. Powell doesn't like it, but I like it. <laughs> um, and I have uh, two tequila shots every night before I go to bed. I got a man with his routine. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Tell me, what do you think is the purpose of life? To enjoy what we have here on Earth as long as we can, because it's a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And just to be happy. Yeah. I just agree. To be happy. Yeah. Follow the path of joy. Finding the cure for cancer. That's what I'm hoping for. But you're working at it. Yep. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Delphine Circle. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free and it will help us keep these incredible interviews coming your way. Here are two other episodes you may enjoy. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle.